All right. I think we're in the century of biology. That thought fuels a lot of what we do at Flagship, the places that we invent, the kind of companies that we start, and what we believe the world is going to look like in a decade and more. And like other engineering disciplines that started with just the basic heuristics of dealing with structural materials, dealing with fluids, dealing with chemistries before you could engineer, I think we're going to go from banging stones together and arranging them in biology to actually getting to build cathedrals. And, and as you're hearing, if you're looking for a place to build cathedrals, agriculture is an awesome place to look. So I grew up in Texas. My grandpa had a farm. We spent summers at the farm. Through that, I got to know the rhythms and cadence and lifestyle of farming some of what's easy, some of what is really hard. And um, all the while, I thought of agriculture as a process, i.e., take seeds, plant them, plants grow up, you harvest the food. And when I thought about technology, I thought about this, tractors, horsepower, irrigation machinery, planes flying over fields. And so as I started immersing myself in technology at MIT and other places, I didn't spend that much time thinking about agriculture, and nor do a lot of people, mostly because I didn't want to work on tractors. But I've come around to the view that agriculture itself is perhaps the world's most important technology. Now, I'm going to start by making a case for that, and then I'm going to introduce some of what we've been doing in the biology of microbiomes in our anatomy and in human healthcare and the role that they play in helping plants survive some extreme stresses. So some of the support for this idea that agriculture is this big of a technology for humanity are it protects us against more disease than any innovation of the biotech era. It employs 40% of the global workforce, supports over $5 trillion of global markets. It's perhaps one of the most important levers for driving the advancement of health and economies in the developing world. And it sustains every one of us. So that's a cool technology. Yet it's even better because it does it via food, whether it's brie or Swiss cheese or turkey and you know, all the other delights that bring us joy, bring us together with our families, become deep parts of our emotions, and you know, an aspect of our lives that we define every day's activities around. So, that by itself is a cool technology, huge economic opportunity, global footprint, affects all of us, does so via food, yet agriculture's product isn't only food, it's us. So on an atom by atom basis, we're made up of the atoms that plants around the world are pulling from the atmosphere and pulling from the soil. And so the couscous that we had for lunch today is delivering to us the atoms that tomorrow our stem cells, our neurons, our muscle cells, our heart cells are going to be made of. And so you really can't find a, a technology that's more deeply woven into who we are. Yet, at the same time, as you've heard, agriculture is facing a ton of challenges, dealing with fresh water, degradation of arable land, growing crops in hotter, drier, more extreme climates each year. And this is the rate of agricultural yield improvement over the past several decades. It's been going down. This is unlike almost any technology curve that you see today, where with Moore's Law and other areas, things are logarithmically going up. And it's not because we've been letting our big toe off the gas pedal or because we want this. It's because those challenges on the previous slide are actually surpassing our ability to innovate here. And this is more of a toy than a device. There we go. If you take the status quo and extrapolate it, it's not clear that we meet the WHO's food requirements for 2050. So this is a time where we actually need to ramp up our ability to influence this biology. And on a daily basis, we're faced with plenty of pessimistic views as to why we're not going to be able to do that, whether it's prior food crises, whether it's agriculture's contribution to climate change, whether it's being the largest cause of biodiversity loss globally, whether it's its influence on species upon which it relies, like pollinators. 
and the pessimistic viewpoint here is compelling, it's urgent, it's emotional, and it's really easy to get stuck in it. What we don't hear a lot of is the optimistic viewpoint, which is what this whole conference is about. And I'd argue that that perspective is so compelling, it should be what we're all thinking about all the time in this area, which is just imagine right now we have an opportunity to reinvent perhaps the technology that enabled human civilization in the first place, which supports trillion dollars of global markets and which affects every single one of us. It's a 10 billion person problem. That's pretty awesome. So that's, that's an invitation to everybody to think agriculture's cool and for it to be the top technology that people uh, imagine improving. I'm gonna talk to you about microbiomes. And I think it helps to revolutionize something if just maybe we've been overlooking a really important part of the puzzle all along. That's true in humans with microbiota, and it's true in agriculture as well. I'll start with some of the biology that's been unfolding in uh, the science of the human microbiome, because over the past 10 years, that's been a real revolution in our understanding of many aspects of human biology. So, so first, what is a microbiome? Simply put, it's a community of microbes that live in one habitat or their genetic material. And that means microbiomes are everywhere. Like it or not, it's on the seat cushion where you're sitting, the back of your chair, all over your clothes. It's in every breath of air that we're taking. And they also interact with us and every other higher life form on Earth. We have microbiota on every one of our habitats. They happen to make up maybe about half of our cells. So 30 trillion of our cells are microbial. The other compartment are human. And if you take the microbes that live in your gut, it's just one example. Think about those microbes. They have an awesome home. I mean, they're getting fed on a regular basis, kept warm, protected from the environment. And now it's clear that via the natural birth process, via breast milk, via the messiness of childhood, we pass our microbiomes on to our kids. So it's even bigger than just them getting the next meal. Their influence on our fitness defines their own fitness. And so take that and play it out over hundreds of millions of years of evolution. It's maybe not surprising that these microbes appear to have been flipping light switches throughout our physiology and can produce the majority of the metabolites that circulate in our blood on a regular basis, constantly regulate our metabolism and our immune system, protect us actively from pathogens. And at times when you take antibiotics, after taking those antibiotics, you can be as susceptible to a new infection as if you were immunocompromised. It's not because your immune system's out of whack, it's because you've lost this defense mechanism of these communities of microbes that are acting on our behalf. And if you follow this area, every week there are new glimpses of ways in which microbes are affecting our neurobiology, affecting our reproduction, our longevity. So one of my favorite quotes that sort of put our human destiny with a, you know, in perspective with some humility around it is that Lynn Margulis, who originated the theory that our mitochondria were once free-living microbes, she says, Perhaps humans are just a device that microbes invented so they could go to the moon. And um, this is what this has been looking like in science over the past 10 years. There's been an exponen exponential explosion of the role that these microbes play in our health. And intellectually, there's this secession from the idea that microbes can harm us, which is still true, to a realization that at any instant in our lives, the vast majority of relationships we have with microbes are actually good for us. And when you think about the implications of that for medicine, perhaps our microbiota is like an extra organ or a whole organ system that's dynamically in interplay with every one of our human organs. And in medicine, for hundreds of years, we've arranged medical specialties around organs and we might have left one out since we've just discovered a new organ in the past decade. So you can go to a neurologist, a pulmonologist, a gastroenterologist, a cardiologist, and get guidance about diseases of that organ. 
you can't do that with your microbiome today. So you can't go to a microbiomologist to get advice. And that sounds like a made-up word that a child would throw out there and say, like, ah, that's hilarious. We don't need that. Well, we need that. If this is this deep a part of our biology, we need that specialty. And second, illustrated on the slide, is that every one of our human organs has tens of billions of dollars of therapeutics that don't kill those organs, but they shift or modulate the physiology of those organs in order to be able to treat disease. So I've been spending a better part of the past six years, and we at Flagship have been heavily invested in building the drug category of microbiome therapeutics. These are some of the efforts that we've had there. They've raised over $300 million to date, and so themselves have sort of become on a, on a world stage with other government bodies as the biggest funders of microbiome science. And the, it's like a Russian dolls thing. The deeper we look, the more interesting it is, and the more, that, the more that's going on in there. But I want to talk about the role that we started to realize existed outside of humans, and that's that for all the same reasons that microbes have been benefiting us, it seemed logical that they might be benefiting plants too in a deeper way than just that plants are surrounded by soil, and soil is full of microbes. In fact, I still remember the day when I came across this observation. If you take any plant in the world and cut it open, every one of its tissues has microbes living inside of them. The roots, the shoots, I still, I mean, I remember the moment that I thought about that, having thought about the human microbiome for so long, like, huh, well, what does that mean that every leaf in a cornfield, a wheat field, a soy field, every root, every shoot has microbes inside of them? That's an awesome home for microbes, just like our gut is. Maybe they pass them on to their progeny via seeds. Are there microbes in seeds? Don't know. In some cases, there appeared to be. Nobody had really systematically looked at that. But when you start to think about the implications and the sort of evolutionary tinkling, tinkering that's happened in us, if those things are true, then maybe the microbiome of plants, i.e. the microbes that plants have been filtering from soils around the world over thousands of years of agriculture and over millions of years of plant evolution, have been co-optimized to influence every trait of fitness, importance, and crops, i.e. not just nutrient stress, but drought, heat, salt, cold, nitrogen, insect, fungi, bacteria. What, that, what might that mean for agriculture? And two, given the challenges of introducing new synthetic technologies, yet the challenges of focusing on natural approaches, seeming that they may be less powerful, less reproducible, as you start to think about the role of whole life forms in protecting a plant, realize that they may be much more sophisticated and impactful than just a single chemistry, just a single gene at a time. And in fact, if you could add them back in places where they've been lost or borrow from evolutionary experiments all over the world, you might be able to have a dramatic influence on crops in a way which is much more natural than current approaches. So there's a bunch of trends that have been talked about in this conference that I, I won't recite that we think fuel an opportunity to be able to not just tinker with this on a one-plant basis, but start to unravel some of the heuristics that define this biology across a global scale. And we've been building an engine to be able to do that. In our early days, we were just kind of exploring. We thought, all right, if you imagine that the whole world is just a big Petri dish, plants, live in various portions of that petri dish, and they've been filtering microbes from their environment and faced with various stresses, some in deserts like this on the left, plants in agricultural fields like here in the middle. Maybe we could look for fitness variations in those experiments and actually be able to sort of harvest the microbiomes which are most beneficial to plants in the wild or to modern crops. So this is a relative of cotton here. Zooming out, this is one of the hottest days in one of the hottest locations in all of Arizona. Yet this plant seems relatively fine with that. Um, our scientists were wilting, but the plant seems okay. On the, in the middle is a cotton field, and 
This is a cotton field under drought stress. You can see some plants seem OK. Other ones never emerged from the ground. And we saw that as you start to look with an agronomic lens at the possibility that those variations are from the microbiome, you could choose fit donors, healthy plants, choose unhealthy plants, and start to experiment. The right is the output of one of these experiments. And we've been doing this in collaborations with some extraordinary scientists in multiple universities. And this is one example of the outcome. Same seeds of, in this case, a soy plant, given either nothing planted in soil, put with a polymer formulation that we use to attach a microbe to its surface, or with one of these microbiota that we'd identified to come from an extraordinary plant in the field. All of them placed, placed under equivalent water stress. And you, you can see the kind of dramatic results that, that in this case came not from changing the genetics at all, not from changing any of the chemistry around the plant, but by changing the microbiome that is inside the plant itself via the coating of a microbe on the seed. This happens to be one microbe. And this is the difference in fitness that you might expect from, as Caleb was saying, healthy soil or good soil versus bad soil. The difference here is that we're adding one one billionth the quantity of microbes and also just one microbe. So we saw this as maybe the tip of the iceberg in terms of what this biology could start to offer. And recognizing the global nature of agriculture, the global principle of evolutionary experimentation that may be underpinning this, we set out to build a discovery platform that could allow us to understand the whole cube, potentially, of geography times different crops, times crops under different stresses in different parts of the world. So that vision has been fueling what we've been building, as has the view that every time we touch a pipette or pull a leaf off a plant, we're starting with a million, thousands, or hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary experiment that nature's done on our behalf. And our job is to build an avalanche of capabilities to understand that. So over the past six years, and prior to that with some of the collaborations that we've created in academia where people have been working in this for a couple decades at times, we've collected over 36,000 plant samples from about 1,000 plant species to try to understand what these microbiomes look like between two corn plants in a field, two corn plants on different continents, corn, wheat, soy, cotton. From those, we've pulled over 40,000 endosymbionts of plants that we've sequenced and have started to understand what can we culture, what can we perturb, and build the sort of data infrastructure where we can start conducting, evaluating biological hypotheses on the scale of this kind of data. Through that, we've started to determine what we call core microbiomes, or if you sequenced all of us here in the room, you'd find microbiome differences in our gut with every one of us as individuals. It's a fingerprint. But our fingerprints and our microbiomes also have a bunch of features in common that if you needed to draw a new fingerprint, you could borrow or observe and draw something that's believably a fingerprint. In the case of our microbiota, it's clear that we can share them with each other. So even when there are differences, there's the opportunity for exchange. And so by building these maps of what plants look like across fields, across locations, across time points, and across hundreds of cultivars within crops, we think we've started to unravel some of the ways in which you could trade microbiomes to the benefit of the fitness of these crops. And then we've built the sort of analytical and testing capabilities to test these hypotheses thousands at a time. Um, we've done four years of greenhouse trials, over five seasons of testing, and we've just commercialized our first products, driven in part by one of the perspectives that came from this kind of an expedition, and that's that you can trace back hundreds of millions of years of plant biology. Agriculture has only been a very small portion of that, and yet if you look at from seed repositories and wild versions of modern agricultural crops, land races, in this case of wheat and, and corn, relative to the microbiome diversity of modern crops, you can see some dramatic changes in the diversity of those communities. An axiom in ecological health is that diversity is, is good. And so 
part of what we view our job to be is to find the missing microbiomes in agricultural crops and put them back for the purpose of being able to restore some of the capabilities that microbiomes provide to plants. And this is what I joke is sort of a, a very, very crude treasure map of the future for this era of agriculture. This is a, a network relating the similarity of various samples that we've taken within a handful of crops. And I wanted to illustrate it as an example of what the future of agricultural innovation would look like. It's pretty different from a tractor. You, you can't draw the solutions to this on a sheet of paper. Two Dimensions does a woefully poor job of even depicting what is going on in these communities. And yet, we're in an era now where we can actually start to understand them, understand differences, and infer and predict changes that could be beneficial to the system. And this is an example of what we've been observing in the field. So this is our first product in cotton. We launched it this year, just about two years after we opened up our lab. We launched our first products in wheat this fall. On the left of this, you see modern uh, variety of cotton. The only difference with the seeds that grew up into the plants on the right is that those seeds had a very thin film coating of our microbiome, in this case of one or two microbes, on the surface of those, uh, of those seeds. Those seeds then use the plant as a bioreactor, become woven into the biology of the plant, and in this case are able to dramatically affect the plant's ability to withstand the water stress that comes every year simply by these plants not being, aggregate, not being irrigated. And over 90% of these crops, as well as corn and soy in the US, aren't irrigated today. So every year, they're dealing with a major water stress imparted just by limitations in our practice of agriculture. Going back to the cube, we're at the foothills of what we think is an amazing journey. We're excited to invite other people along with those journeys. And as in other areas where there's a big opportunity, um, if we're right about this, there's the chance to be able to have an extraordinary impact on the world and also to be able to do so in a way that creates extraordinary financial reward. And there are a bunch of different aspects of the future of agriculture that you can start to imagine with this kind of technology and we have rolling around in our heads all the time. Among the most important of these is the possibility that we can change practices like spraying pesticides on hundreds of millions of acres. That's what we do today. And arguably, we need those technologies today. But if you take a step back, it's sort of crazy. I think we'll look back hundreds of years from now and say, man, I'm really glad we don't have to do that anymore. That, that was crazy in hindsight. And this is one lever that we think is going to have a role in this. But going back to the opportunity in agriculture, it's such an amazing technology. The closer you get to it, the more important and more interesting of a problem this is. I'd invite all of you that are interested, curious, or with friends that are looking for places to innovate, think about our food, think about our agriculture, and think about what an amazing future could be ahead of us in those. Thanks very much for your attention.